your life. Okay, great. Good evening. Uh, so we are here together for the New York Symposium with Diane Sayre, and I'm Diane Sayre. Dennis Speed, who normally moderates, is not able to be with us this evening, partly due to technical difficulties, but I think more due to the fact that tomorrow, starting at 9 a.m., is the first day of a two-day International Schiller Institute conference, which will go from 9 a.m. till 4 p.m. Saturday, 9 a.m. till 4 p.m. Sunday. You can look in the uh, chat and comment boxes if you're watching on YouTube Live or Facebook. Oh, and here it's going to be right on the screen uh, for the uh, conference registration. Um, it is this conference is coming at an absolutely crucial time because for us to overcome the crisis before us the population of the united states is going to have to begin to think and act on a much higher level and not just take things as they're presented at face value and i actually thought it might be useful to begin by showing a video, which we'll get to in just a minute, which reflects on Lyndon LaRouche and his success in the elections of 1986, his and his associates who were running for offices in Democratic Party primaries all over the country. Um, for people who may or may not know, LaRouche passed away last year at the age of 96. He was an FDR Democrat, emphatically not a liberal but uh, committed to scientific and industrial progress and a world order not defined by the British liberal imperialist system as FDR envisioned at the end of World War II. And as he told Winston Churchill, uh, we are not fighting this war to liberate people from concentration camps, to have them under concentration camps without walls in the form of colonial policies and practices imposed by British, French, Dutch uh, colonists on nations in Africa, Asia, and South America. And Churchill got red in the face. And at one point he said, what you're proposing would be to end the British empire. And of course, that was exactly the point. Well, to the great dismay of the probably the people now running the Democratic Party and the fascist treasonous operation it is. In 86, LaRouche's associates won uh, Democratic Party primaries and also significant percentages of the vote. And it wasn't much after that that Robert Mueller up in Boston indicted LaRouche. And not too long after that, when the Boston trial fell apart because the judge had a modicum of commitment to justice, uh, the trial proceeded in Alexandria, Virginia, and Lyndon LaRouche at the age of 67 was given a 15-year jail sentence and sent off to prison, and only an international mobilization freed him. But uh, just to give you a sense of this, I want to show you this little clip here. Uh, we can't hear the uh, audio. Yeah, there's no sound. Oh, when you uh, when you share video, make sure to I'm clip watching. the. Oh, there you go. 1986. The world was stunned by the news that two candidates from the Democratic Party's growing Larouche faction, Mark Fairchild and Janice Hart had one nomination to statewide offices in the Illinois primary. During the Democratic Party primaries of 1984 and 86, dozens of candidates associated with Lyndon LaRouche received more than 30 or 40% of the vote for statewide or congressional nominations. The Hart and Fairchild victories showed that a growing plurality of the Democratic voters was turning to support the LaRouche faction within the Democratic Party. There is a deepening crisis in our national life. 
As this crisis worsens, more and more citizens are searching for a new kind of political leadership. For this reason, over the years since the 1970s, the fame and influence of Lyndon LaRouche has grown rather steadily, from obscurity back in 1975 to his worldwide recognition of today. Back during the years between 1975 and 78, long before LaRouche's name was known to most voters, parts of our liberal establishment decided that Lyndon LaRouche was a potential threat to their political power and to their policies. Even back then, the establishment encircled LaRouche with a ring of political containment. As one Washington Post editorial page feature back in 1976 stated, the liberal news media policy has been, for more than 10 years, almost never to report what Lyndon LaRouche does, except to attack him with brief, coordinated campaigns of wild name-calling and fictitious accusations. Between the years 1983 and 85, that news media containment began to break apart. In the March 1986 Illinois primary, LaRouche zoomed to national political prominence. Political extremist Lyndon LaRouche. Political extremist Lyndon LaRouche. Political extremist Lyndon LaRouche. Political extremist Lyndon LaRouche. You should be concerned that the LaRouche menace is alive and well in the United States. How you went from being socialist revolutionaries to neo-Nazis camouflaged as Democrats. He is obsessed with Teutonic musical forms because I think they're scared to death of Lyndon LaRouche. You're unmuted. I mean, you're muted. Thank you. You can see we were really on the march, and then suddenly the witch hunt began. Our publications were shut down by the government. Dozens of our organizers were arrested. Our offices were raided. This was 1986, 87, 88, 89. So all of the things that people see going on now with President Trump, his associates like Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, etc. was done to the LaRouche organization in the 1980s. And Ramsey Clark, the former U.S. Attorney General who took LaRouche's case on the appeal, made the argument that if this can be done to someone like Lyndon LaRouche, an eight-time presidential candidate, that time I guess he'd run about four times, a presidential candidate with a quarter of a million subscribers and supporters, then no one in the country is safe. And in fact, uh, what happened, and I want to get now to what's happening with President Trump, and I have just learned, as have you probably, that the Supreme Court has denied the Texas um, hearing or the Texas um, suit on the voter fraud around the country and the irregularities that went into this election. Um, look, this is not a case you're going to win in a courtroom. And I'll tell you something that happened to us. Uh, after LaRouche had been put in jail, 
we were fighting, we were fighting to get an appeal. And what happened was a federal bankruptcy judge dis- ruled that the federal government had committed fraud on the court when they said that our entities were bankrupt. And I won't go through all the details, but they used this bankruptcy to seize all of our assets. So federal judge ruled that the government had committed fraud on the courts. So we naively thought, oh, they've admitted the government committed fraud against LaRouche. Everyone should get out of jail. The case should be over. Did that happen? No. Uh, just a minute. Uh, did that? No, it did not happen because when they ran the witch hunt, they didn't think LaRouche was guilty. They never believed there was any crime. So why would proving that he was not guilty do anything to undo the uh, the witch hunt? And the way that we got him out is that his wife, Helga Zepp LaRouche, organized an international movement to put a spotlight on the injustice in the United States. And we began a huge fight in the United States where we had hundreds of state legislators, some congressmen, uh, city council members, heads of organizations, church leaders, all saying, we know the truth. Lyndon LaRouche is a political prisoner. He has to be freed and he should be exonerated. And finally, five years into his sentence, we managed to get him out of prison. We got all of our political prisoners released ultimately, although Mike Billington ended up serving 10 years in prison. But my point is this was not one in the courts. It was one because people decided to show some courage and stand up. And that's exactly what President Trump said about his case. He said, I don't know if we'll win. It depends on the courage of some judges and others. Now, uh, Congressman Pascrell has just moved that the 126 uh, congressmen who signed a friend of the court briefs in support of this case, he's saying none of them should be allowed back into the Congress because they um, because they're calling for an insurrection. Well, what's the insurrection? Is it stealing everyone's vote or is it standing up for the truth? Um, so we have a big fight and there's a lot at stake. And what I just wanted to say um, before I pass this to Daniel is we have a beautiful statement from the leader of the Schiller Institute or the BRICS Youth Parliament, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. That's the block of nations that's organizing for a new credit policy for real economic growth and development. Now imagine being in Yemen We have millions of people facing starvation thanks to the bombing by the Saudis and now intensified from Pompeo's sanctions. And um, here is what he, he writes to the conference. The famine in Yemen is a war crime. Dear participants in this important conference, Yemen today is suffering from the worst famine in modern history. But unlike other countries, it is not the result of natural disasters or the collapse of supply chains. It is a war crime committed by the Saudi and Emirati aggressors with the full backing of the United States, Britain, and Israel through a combination of seven years of bombardment and destruction of Yemen's basic infrastructure and agricultural capabilities. This combined with a total blockade of the air, sea, and land routes for 30 million people who are completely import dependent. This means a premeditated act of mass murder. Uh, He says, um, upon receiving the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the World Food Program, David Beasley, the executive director of the World Food Program, said a few days ago, quote, I know that just as the World Food Program receives this coveted award in a nameless village in Yemen, a skeletal child will be hovering close to death, hooked to a feeding tube. You have no doubt seen these children in fleeting images on your television screens. 
Well, let me tell you, those images don't come close to the reality, unquote. He added that, quote, what is happening in Yemen now is a shame. We all share that shame and we need to end it together, unquote. Then Fuad says, having said that, I would like to emphasize that thanks to our sense of identity and dignity, derived from one of the oldest civilizations in the world, we have managed to stand against this aggression and blockade. Despite this tragic situation, the world can witness that in Sana'a and other cities governed by the Supreme Political Council, internal security and peace is achieved with the lowest crime record recorded. Besides, here we see a light shining at the end of this long and dark tunnel because the school of Lyndon LaRouche holds high the light of his ideas. Here we can see how the Al Bricks Youth Parliament with its logo have proudly bedecked with LaRouche's five metrics of progress. These metrics of progress have been transferred to Yemen and they are the key to inspiring the transformation of China, which just announced its victory over extreme poverty. This is the standard of the new paradigm declared by Mrs. LaRouche. If we don't stop the starving of the people of Yemen, this will explode into a destabilizing factor for the whole region and will disrupt the development of the new Silk Road. The Schiller Institute campaign to stop the war and blockade and restore Yemen's national sovereignty will pave the way to reaching our national vision 2030 as defined by Operation Felix for the reconstruction of Yemen that was envisioned by the Schiller Institute. We hope that this great conference will come with a, out with a resolution backing the World Food Program for immediate humanitarian relief, but also renewing the call for stopping the aggression and the blockade. So it's a very beautiful and important message also, people may not be aware, there are massive farm demonstrations in India, in Europe. Uh, in India, 10,000 farmers committed suicide in 2019. These are things that are kept from you by the lying U.S. news media. And this is why the fight for the United States to restore itself to its Republican with a small r intent of our founding fathers is so critical that we do this not for ourselves, but we do it for the good of mankind. And that is why people listening should not um, fall into the silly lines that this um, attack on us came from Venezuela or China. That's just not true. It's the British Empire. We do not need martial law. We do not need military action. We need for the American people to rise to the challenge and begin to think on a strategic level. And that's what this conference is dedicated to. And that's what Daniel is going to tell us a little bit about now. And just to say, for those of you who don't know, Daniel just completed a campaign for US Senate in New Jersey as a LaRouche independent candidate and as a major leader of our international organization. Thank you very much, Diane. Um, well, in pursuance of this you know, question of changing how we think to be able to overcome what is a grave civilizational crisis, I'd like to share with you a little bit about the central concept that we're trying to elaborate uh, or unfold in the process of this two-day conference that begins tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. The concept that Helga Zepp LaRouche, the president of the Schiller Institute and founder, as well as the widow of Lyndon LaRouche has um, identified as being critical is called coincidentia oppositorum in the original Latin, uh, otherwise known in English as the coincidence of opposites. And this is um, a reference to a breakthrough in thinking that happened on account of the work of a German cardinal uh, named Nicholas of Cusa, who came forward in the period 
around 14, the 1430s, 1440s, and then into the end of his life in, I think, 1463 or 1464, he came forward with a, a transformation of our image of the human mind, our understanding of the nature of humanity, which, and the relationship between the human mind and the universe. And it, it just changed everything. It, he broke down a rigid chain on, on the mind that had been imposed by Aristotle, you know, several hundred years before the birth of Christ, and had kept that, you know, Europe, kept that area of the world in a dark age, in a de in continuously declining dark age uh, for 1700 years. I mean, really, like, think about what happened. Rome in the year 100 AD had a million people in it. Today, the metropolitan area of Rome has like three and a half million. So in 100 AD, huge number of people. By 1420, Rome had about 50,000 people living in it. What had happened over the course of 1700 years or so, well, actually, of course, 1300 years in this case, what had happened was a dramatic collapse in the population. How could it be that 1300 years later, we were less advanced. It's not just about an empire collapsing. It's about what were the um, strictures that were placed on, on people that they couldn't get past. Not, not in terms of their, you know, of their, their, uh, their particular personal experience of life, but really the, the process of the development of the human mind. What had been done to block that so that problems could not be solved? And if you really wanna get an understanding of this, take a look at the population chart of the world. And you'll notice that right around the time of Nicholas of Cusa's life and thereafter, there's an enormous increase in the rate of increase of the human population. That comes from the coincidence of opposites, the breakthrough in thinking represented by the coincidence of opposites. <clears throat> so what is this about? Well, under Aristotelian thinking, when there are two contradictories, then that's just the way the world is. And you will tend to uh, suit your vision of what the world might be on the basis of your sense impression, what you see before you, the contradictions that you encounter in your central experience, and even in your rational experience, meaning like your, your ability to, to make an argument, to compare between two different uh, ideas. We, you would Ascent to the, the notion, for example, that some people are born masters and some people are born slaves. And that that's just the way the world is. But under the co coincidence of opposites, you have a means of resolving an hypothesis that doesn't fit, <laughs> that doesn't actually describe the world, the universe as such. You say to yourself, wait a second, even when there are contradictions that don't seem to be explicable, that seem irreconcilable, it is possible to go beyond that, which is the whole purpose of a book that Cusa wrote in 1440 called uh, uh, De Docta Ignorantia, Unlearned Ignorance. It's possible to go beyond that and ascend onto a higher realm of thinking where from the standpoint of the infinite, you can look down upon the problems of the created universe and you can perceive of a deeper cause which you can grab hold of and do something with. You can change the apparent irreconcilable problem. You can change the character of that and even solve it by grabbing hold of that which is actually causing these contradictions to come forward. 
Or to put it another way, you can actually use the method of hypothesis to conceive of a more truthful understanding of what the universe really is in order to resolve this problem. Now, I'll give you a very direct example of what that would mean today. Today, what has been advanced in an absolutely dangerous way, I mean, frightening, frightening way by Mike Pompeo, by the British establishment, the British Empire's mouthpieces in London and otherwise, uh, by various others like uh, Billingsley, the, uh, the president's um, um, nuclear arms trade negotiator, an arms uh, reduction negotiator. The concept that's been pre presented by them is that we live in a world in which the United States and China can never, ever work together. They literally cannot coexist. If you watch uh, Mike Pompeo's speeches, he repeatedly emphasizes this. We cannot coexist with the, uh, with the Chinese Communist Party. Now, first of all, like actually have a little bit of a thought about how radical this is relative to where we were during the Cold War, where it was understood that, you know, by people like Ronald Reagan, that you could ascend unto a solution that would solve things in a way that both the USSR and the United States could end the Cold War. As when Ronald Reagan adopted Lyndon LaRouche's Strategic Defense Initiative, which was an idea to actually get these two powers to work together on space-based uh, missile defense systems. There were people during the Cold War who actually understood that. But Mike Pompeo, he doesn't say trust but verify. He says distrust and period. In fact, um, he specifically referred to that statement, I forget, and transformed it. Um, if we're going to solve this, don't listen to the people who go forward and say, Oh, I'm for peace. I'm for, you know, U.S. and China relations. I've met a lot of them. They have a lot of nice, fancy events in New York City. Uh, think tanks like the, uh, the, uh, the, the U.S.-China National Committee or the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. Think tanks like uh, the Asia Society. They like to come out and say, oh, yeah, we're for U.S. and China and work together. But if you listen to what they have to say, they're talking about merely balancing geopolitical interests. And they almost all say that US and China can work together to defeat climate change, which is a way of dooming both nations because the so-called solutions to this climate hoax are destruction of fossil fuels, destruction of economies, everything. Don't listen to that. We don't need that. That's just the continued management of the present failed system. It'll never work. What you need is to actually make a new hypothesis about what humanity is, which would provide the basis for perceiving the union of uh, the interests of the United States and China. The union of the interest, the interest of the United States and China is not to like calm things down. That's not the point. No, it's never going to work. You must actually consider from the standpoint of the future. And by the future, I don't mean like six months. I don't mean 50 years. I don't mean a thousand years. I mean the future per se from the standpoint of man's immortal progress into the solar system, into the galaxy, into this universe, where we carry out our mission as the only creative species known, the only creative species we know of. From that standpoint, the US and China have a common interest, which is the redefinition of mankind. 
not as a species, I, I, you know, limited by the resources that presently exist, limited by the world as we see it, but rather as one that has a grasp on the creative powers that open up completely new vistas, like the industrialization of the moon and Mars. Because if we think from that standpoint, then all of the assumptions about the geopolitical view fall away. The assumption about limited resources, the assumption that there's, you know, there's bound to be poverty, there's bound to be famine, there's bound to be disease. Remember what Kennedy said, those are the enemies of the United States, not any country. And so if we think from that standpoint, then we will be embodying the true patriotic nature of the United States the true purpose, and we will be expressing this coincidence of opposites. Uh, and that's only one impression that I'd like to give you of that concept. And I hope you come into the conference to study this more directly and more fully, because there's much to say. Thank you. Great. So I think we'll go. Thank you, Daniel. I think Daniel has to leave to get to another meeting. Um, but I'll now introduce Richard Black, who is the Schiller Institute's representative at the United Nations, has been critical in organizing these conferences to a large degree, and he can let everyone know what's going to happen tomorrow and the next day. Or we don't know what's going to happen, but we'll have some clue. Go ahead, Richard. Okay, thanks, Diane. <clears throat> so people can see in the uh, uh, chat area, both on Facebook and YouTube, uh, the uh, place to go to get an invitation to attend the conference. So I would uh, invite everybody listening uh, to, after we finish speaking over the next half hour, uh, sign up and attend the conference beginning 9 a.m. tomorrow. The, the conference is entitled The World After the U.S. Election creating a world based on reason. And just to give you a little bit of uh, background to add what Daniel uh, discussed, the Schiller Institute is named after a very unusual revolutionary by the name of Friedrich Schiller. He lived at the time of the American Revolution. He was in Germany, he was a teacher, a brilliant historian, most famous as a poet and a playwright. He wrote, for instance, the famous play, uh, William Tell. And he said uh, famously that if you, if you want to be a, a man or a woman of virtue, if you want to call yourself a good person, then you have to be a patriot of your nation and a world citizen. Now that for most people today is a contradiction. I mean, if you're a patriot, then you say, well, my nation comes first. You're a patriot of America or Mexico or whatever. You're a patriot uh, and he's a world citizen. Oh, that's, uh, that's something that the liberals talk about. No, forget that world. I'm a patriot. Or you may say, uh, I'm a world citizen. Meaning, I don't, I'm not concerned about my nation and my government. I'm a world citizen. Well, what Schiller said is that you have to be a patriot of your own nation and a world citizen. How is that possible? To my mind, that's one of the uh, simple contradictions uh, that were, is part of common sense these days. Hey, it's one or the other. And that's what we're gonna take up at this conference, that my job, your job, is to be a patriot of your nation and a world citizen. And this is expressed also in the American Revolution. People talk about, oh, the great Hamilton, the great Washington, the great Benjamin Franklin, and we, you know, we beat them. We have the Tea Party, we beat them. Well, for any of you who've studied the American Revolution, you know that great patriots, when the war began against the damned British Empire under Washington's direction, leading patriots came to the United States from Poland, from Germany, from France, leading intellectuals, leading military thinkers, and signed up to be Washington's lieutenants. When the decisive battles came, 
to vanquish the British. It was the French Navy and the French uh, infantry that were at Washington's side. So that victory, that patriotic victory, was in fact a world event. It was not an American event. It was a world event. So immediately after the revolution, you saw the same thing. This shocked the world, completely shocked the world, that this tiny force around the power of, of a new conception of man could vanquish the completely uh, unbeatable British Empire in Russia at the time. The American Revolution was studied and examined and discussed. Uh, what does this mean? This is a new type of self-government. This is a new type of world that's coming into being. Uh, the same thing throughout Europe. Right after the revolution, this American Revolution exported itself, the American system throughout the Pacific, uh, going, going west. Into, the, into Honolulu, into China. The overthrow of the dynasty in China in 1911 directly came out of studies of the American Revolution, the Lincoln American system. So what's often thought of as a, an American victory was in fact a world victory, was a victory for all mankind. So this idea of how to think like a world citizen being an American patriot in our case here and a world citizen, this is gonna be, hopefully we'll be able to shine some light on this for everybody, for the several thousand people who will be listening tomorrow. And, and we hope that you'll be one of them. There'll be four panels of the conference. The first one tomorrow morning at nine o'clock is entitled, Hang Together or Hang Separately, Free and Sovereign Republics or a di digital dictatorship. And we will take up the massive vote fraud ongoing. Uh, and in the, in the recent US national election, the International Investigative Commission on Truth in Elections will have American and overseas representatives who have examined what occurred in that fraudulent election. And they will, be, they will report on their findings from an international legal standpoint. There will be a spokesman analyzing the situation uh, around the, the hideous uh, ongoing murder of Julian Assange, a presentation entitled, The Crucifixion of Julian Assange, a journalist committed to truth and peace. Holly Schlanger, who many of you know, will be giving an up-to-date uh, report on, on the battle lines around the outcome of that election. And there will be also a report on uh, the dictatorship of the mind, the way mass social control coming out of the laboratories of the British Empire, the mass media, of course, the mass media have been attempting and in many cases succeeding in brainwashing and dumbing down the American population for many, many decades. Recently, we have the advent of the mass brainwashing of social media. So one of, one of uh, LaRouche's associates will be giving, a, I guarantee you, a breathtaking picture of how uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, et cetera, Google, how they come out. This is a, essentially a hundred year project of mass manipulation of populations. All that will be covered in the first panel. The second panel will be keynoted, keynoted by the brilliant Helga LaRouche the president of the Schiller Institute. And she will take up uh, specifically two areas. Number one, uh, as, they, as uh, uh, Daniel was talking about before, this increasing confrontation with the US military industrial complex moving for the encirclement of China, the encirclement of Russia, and the increasing danger of nuclear war in the short term. And at the same time, the, the other side of the global crisis, the monetary crisis, the massive global debt bubble about to blow, which is now accelerated because of the pandemic, the economic lock lockdown, et cetera. So there will be major speeches from American leaders, leaders from Germany, France, many nations of Africa, all discussing 
the global crisis as a whole and what the great powers like the United States, the role that they need to play and what the former colonial sector, South America, Central America, Southeast Asia, Africa, what role these, uh, these countries who have never been allowed to develop, what role they must courageously take uh, currently as well. So those are the two panels on, on Saturday. Sunday morning, the panel is entitled 9 a.m., Overcoming the World Health Crisis and Hunger Pandemic, Thinking on the Level of the Coincidencia Oppositorum, what, what Daniel was describing to us a few minutes ago. And this will be essentially, in addition to uh, American activists and diplomats and leaders from overseas, this will be a discussion of uh, the, this committee, which was initiated by Helga Zeplarouche in June, called the Committee for the Coincidence of Opposites, Opposites, bringing together in the United States medical leaders, social leaders, civil rights leaders, uh, healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, all kinds of organizations from every walk of life that can be mobilized and are being mobilized in the United States to form what would be a kind of uh, health conservation corps, the recruitment of youth across the country who could be trained in 12 weeks, 16 weeks to be uh, uh, medics forming an, uh, an army of, of salvation uh, to be able to move into the areas where this famine that Diane was talking about, the pandemic ravaging uh, the Southern part of the globe an entire discussion of leaders in these fields will occur under Helga LaRouche's direction in that, uh, in that panel that Sunday morning, nine o'clock. And the conference will finish in the afternoon with a panel entitled, A Human Future for Youth, A Beethoven-Driven Renaissance of, of Classical Culture. And Diane will be the moderator of that panel. Helga Zeplarouche, other uh, leaders and musicians uh, from the Schiller Institute will be giving presentations on the method of class classical composition, the method of classical thinking, uh, Beethoven, Schiller, and a series of leaders and activists from the international youth movement will be giving presentations uh, as well. Diane may have uh, further things to say about about that panel. So that in summary is, uh, is what it looks like. And it is gonna to be uh, totally surprising, totally exciting. Uh, some of, many of the international speakers are gonna present fabulous presentations, which uh, are gonna uh, really force you to think differently. And that's the idea of the conference, how to think like a world citizen. So that's that's my summary, Diane. Great, thanks. So um, Daniel's not with us. Uh, I don't know if there are more thoughts. I'll just say one thing quickly. Um, LaRouche has, who himself was a remarkable leader, uh, wrote in one of his platforms, the qualifications necessary for someone to be a leader and the number one qualification he listed was agape. Uh, people think of the word charity or char love of mankind, but it's love of mankind, love of God, love of truth. Um, it's different than erotic love, love an, of an object, love of a thing, of, of you know, having a crush on someone or whatever, but a profound abiding emotion in a sense which, which is resonates with the immortality of mankind. And his policies flowed from the idea of mankind as a whole, each nation being sovereign and being able to act in its capacity as a sovereign nation. But if you wanna measure physical economy, he would talk about why free trade was so destructive because it lowers the productive capacity of the planet as a whole. If you can imagine, taking a Ford motor plant somewhere outside of Detroit, 
where you have American workers with health care, with education, who are well paid, who go work a 40 hour week, have families, have recreation, the quality of what they produce, their propensity to make discoveries, and they improve the process of production. Now imagine you take that same plant and you move it into uh, Indonesia in some jungle somewhere where you're using child labor, people are working 15 hour days. What happens? Obviously the quality of what you're producing will go down. There'll probably be a lot of pollution. So the guy who owns the plant might make a lot of money in the short term but what happens to your humanity on the planet is that humanity and the planet itself is downgraded by that action and i think i've been thinking about this a lot i happened to watch a video today on um, the use of ivermectin uh, which is a drug that seems to be extremely effective in not only treating COVID-19, but as a prophylactic. And there was a doctor pleading with the Congress and he sounded completely frustrated uh, because he has seen so many people die of this disease and that there seems to be an intention to only take the root of things that are highly expensive from the pharmaceutical companies and not do what's needed to do to save lives. And I was reflecting on how much of everything is measured in monetary terms and how much control this financial dictatorship has over our lives, this gigantic derivatives bubble in the city of London, and how counter that is to actually a real economic system and the work of Lyndon LaRouche. And one of the things that I think will come out of this conference is that everybody can be liberated from thinking of the world in those linear, um, pragmatic terms, but to actually think of where we are today versus what is the great potential of mankind, even just using the science and technology that we have today. There is no reason for anybody to be starving on this planet right now. Um, so I just wanted to stress that in terms of people set aside the time nine to four Saturday, nine to four Sunday. It's Schiller Institute.com S C H I L L E R Institute.com. And, uh, Richard, do you have anything, any other thoughts? Just to say that, um, if you tune in, uh, there will be people listening, uh, by the thousands throughout the United States throughout Africa, in Asia, in South America. There'll be simultaneous translation uh, in German, uh, French, and Spanish. So it, will, it, it truly will be a worldwide town meeting. And I can, I can tell everybody that uh, in great nations like Russia, in great nations like China, they are studying what Helga LaRouche puts out uh, Tooth, you know, with a fine tooth comb. Uh, these ideas are not floating around someplace, but uh, the pressing emergency for the world of this famine, of this global pandemic, now ravaging again at, at record rates, this could be used to push interna international forces to come together with a new type of idea, what Helga LaRouche calls a new paradigm. Turn the horrible crisis into an opportunity. And that's the idea tomorrow. Great. So thank you very much. I think we'll conclude here. Thanks for joining us. I'll see all of you next Friday and uh, be there tomorrow, 9 a.m. sharp. You don't want to miss the first panel. It's going to start with a bang, it sounds like. So take care and good night.